science as a subject is different from science the way it is practiced. So, you know, when scientists do science, what is it they're looking for? Well, different scientists, I mean, different people will say different things, but one of the sort of very nice and striking things about science is that it tells you about reality, and what you find is that reality is not the way you thought it is. You know, there's something weird, actually, that one often finds, and it's really the way it is. I think you'll hear more about this in today's lecture. And, uh, you know, with these few words, welcome once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mustansir. Uh, I'd like to uh, tell you something about uh, the speaker today. Uh, Sankar Das Sharma is the Richard E. Prangi Professor, Chair in Physics, and a distinguished uh, university professor at the University of Maryland in the USA. Uh, he's a fellow of the Joint Quantum Institute and the director of the Condensed Matter Theory Center at the University of Maryland. Uh, Shankar received his PhD from Brown University in 1979 and has been a faculty member at Maryland since 1980. His undergraduate degree is from the famous uh, Presidency College in Calcutta. Uh, and uh, his research interests are the quantum theory of matter, statistical mechanics, quantum information, and uh, very many diverse areas in physics, uh, ranging from collective behavior of many body interacting quantum systems to topological quantum computation, fluctuations in financial markets, physics of high speed transistors and exotic quantum properties of solids, atoms at ultra low temperatures, etc. Shankar is a very, very prolific physicist, uh, and uh, his work has had very high impact. I think he has also trained a large number of students and mentored many, many postdocs, including those who went on to do very important work later on. And uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor for us that uh, Shankar is uh, giving this public lecture. He is, in fact, visiting India in connection with uh, delivering the Subramaniam Chandrasekhar lectures of uh, the International Center for Theoretical Sciences of TIFR in Bangalore. And uh, we thought it was a wonderful idea if he came here and also gave a public lecture. So with those few words, uh, I'd like to welcome Shankar to give his talk. Ah. I'm so sorry. We have a small memento, actually, for Shankar, which I would like to ask uh, Mustansir to give it to him. Thank you very much. My apologies. OK. All right. Okay, thank you, Spenter. Thank you, Mustanshir. Uh, it's uh, indeed a great pleasure for me to give this talk here on quantum mechanics. Uh, let me start by saying that, um, of course, uh, human beings have many fabulous accomplishments. Uh, classical music, art that we have outside, literature, all our technology, and uh, various other things like that. But perhaps a case can be made that if you ask the question, what is the greatest accomplishment of homo sapiens? You know, these are the kind of things we like to do in the United States, rank everything, including ranking accomplishments. Probably it's not a meaningful exercise, but we rank universities all the time. Uh, and so why not? I think a case can be made that quantum mechanics may very well be the greatest accomplishment of homo sapiens. I mean, it's certainly one of the greatest accomplishments. Then it depends on whether you think uh, Beethoven's fifth is above quantum mechanics or not. Uh, I personally put quantum mechanics above all other uh, accomplishments of uh, human beings, but I may be slightly biased. So uh, 
the world around us uh, seems classical, right? And, and classical laws are all completely well understood by 1900 and industrial revolution, electricity, all these things are based on classical laws. The world around us seems to obey Newton's law very well, gravitation, Maxwell's equations, and so on. Uh, much of engineering is based on it. Planets, bridges, airplanes, buildings, they're all based on these laws. Uh, cars, boats, trains, they move on these laws. In fact, going to the moon was basically an application of Newton's laws, very precise with some relativistic correction, precise solution of Newton's equations. Uh, using the computer and then programming it into, into the rockets. So they all follow Newton's laws of motions and gravitation, Maxwell's laws of electricity and so on. So the classical world is all around us. But we know that this is uh, a little bit of a, uh, this is a little bit fake. The world is actually quantum mechanics. Ultimate interpretation of existence, which, you know, as I said, is the greatest intellectual achievement. It is actually quantum. We also know that quantum reduces to classical at macroscopic everyday level. The microscopic quantum world, we also know is weird and counterintuitive, I'll talk about it. Some aspects of quantum world is bizarre by classical. For example, one thing that we have heard, and I'm gonna talk about it, this is Feynman's way of doing quantum mechanics, is that if you're going from point A to point B, point A is some event, and point B is some other event, it's not just going Spatially, it's not just coming from the airport here. It's from some event A, you are going to some event B. Feynman told us one way of doing quantum mechanics is that you take all possible paths connecting A and B, all possible classical paths connecting A and B, all possible paths going through all the intermediate steps, and sum over all of them, and then you get, that's the correct result. This seems very bizarre because to go from here to the airport, this is saying I have to go through the moon, I have to go through the sun, I have to go through other galaxies, and I have to sum all of them to get the final result. You know, nothing could be more bizarre than that, but this we know that this is exactly equivalent to quantum mechanics, and of course then Feynman made this, made this very famous statement, it's actually in his book. I think it is safe to say that no one understands quantum mechanics. I think this was safe to say in 1965, it's no longer safe because I claim I do understand quantum mechanics, and I think so does Jim Eisenstein. So I think this was kind of fashionable to say in 1965. Now I think it should be more correct to say, it is safe to say that we understand quantum mechanics, but maybe classical mechanics you don't understand that well. And we'll discuss that. So uh, it is the most successful theory ever conceived by homo sapiens. Whether it's the greatest achievement of human beings or not may be a debatable point, but the fact that it's the greatest scientific theory is not debatable because a great scientific theory is, a great successful scientific theory is based on its verification by experiments because a theory is description of reality to, in, at some level and uh, quantum mechanics is almost 100 years old and no violation of quantum mechanics has ever been discovered in any experiment anywhere. It's just an absolute statement of fact. Sometimes experimental results come up which look like it is in disagreement with quantum mechanical prediction and within a few months, a few years, if not a few months, those experiments then are corrected and quantum mechanics is, is safe. And it has been specifically verified anomalous magnetic moment of proton to 12 decimal places. Atomic clocks, which are purely quantum phenomena, keep time to one part in 10 to the power 15. It's going to be very soon one part in 10 to the power 18. So quantum mechanics is an incredibly uh, verified theory. So it's the most successful theory ever. So colors that we see, for example, this is solar disk, color of various gems, spectrum of various elements, uh, they all arise from quantum mechanics. It's because of spectral lines, which is the quantum mechanical result, that's why you have them. Uh, then um, if you look at modern technology, and I'm just gonna give some examples, they all work at some level because of quantum mechanical principles. Transistors, magnetic disks, superconductors, lasers. We all know, I don't have to explain it in great details, although I'm gonna give you some example, that they are based on some aspects of quantum principles. But what may not be as well known, that even something very far removed from physics, drug manufacturing also depends on quantum mechanics. And that connection is a bit indirect. Drug manufacturing is of course a, a, a subject of chemistry. But imagine you want to create some drug which will cure some disease and you have kind of idea what kind of molecule you want for this drug, but you don't know exactly which 
combination of atoms you'll have to use. And this molecule, typically these will be organic molecules which may have 1,000 atoms in them or 500 atoms in them. So the ground set of this molecule, depending on how you put these atoms together, will have very, very large, they will span a very large configurational space. And to, you can build all those molecules, build the drug, and then do, you can do clinical trial. That will be one, very expensive, and two, it will take a very long time. So what drug companies typically do, they hire a whole bunch of theorists who solve the quantum mechan mechanical problem numerically. So that you, you, you solve what the ground state would look like for all these atoms, and these are called density functional theory or cone tram theory, and then you do some molecular dynamics simulation to put it classical physics. What that does, that eliminates large part of phase space, configuration space that you think would not be very useful. Then you create those drugs and do clinical trial. And in fact, uh, Walter Cohn, uh, was given a Nobel Prize for this in chemistry, although he's a pure physicist, because it played a very important, it plays a very important role in chemistry. So, you know, so all of these are possible because the world is uh, quantum. One th example that I'll give is the distinction between metal and insulator is purely quantum. There is no classical explanation for why some objects conduct electricity very well and some objects don't conduct electricity at all. Now, you may not be impressed by this uh, distinction, but these are the largest distinctions we have in a physical property between materials. You know, a, a, a good metal and a good insulator, their resistivities will differ by a factor of more than 10 to the power 20, 20. Now, how do we, so if you take the ratio, ratio of course is a dimensionless number, right? You take resistivity of copper versus resistivity of a piece of plastic. And the resistivity of copper will be 10 to the power 22 times lower than the resistivity of, uh, of, of a piece of plastic. Now, it, since a dimensionless number, you have to ask the question, what dimensionless combination of classical constants can give you this number 10 to the power 22? And it turns out there is none. I mean, you just cannot explain this classically at all. Uh, so, so I'm going to come back to that. So even to understand something as simple as why some materials are metals and some materials insulators, you have to invoke quantum mechanics. But of course, we know that you know, quantum devices are all around us. I don't have to tell you what they are. Uh, without quantum mechanics, you'll not have any of these devices. Uh, so let me go to this distinction between conductor and insulator, where their resistivities differ by a factor of a trillion trillion. So lasers are related to this property also. So what it is, we all know it's connected with the concept of energy band, which was one of the first applications of quantum mechanics after it came around. What happens is that in certain materials, so the, the, in classical physics, an object, a car that you are driving can have any energy you want. Energy is given by, energy of a car is given by half mv square, where m is its mass, v is its velocity, half mv square. And since v can take any value, as you increase the velocity, its energy is continuous. We know in quantum mechanics, energy is discrete. So you have these energy bands. And then if the band is partially filled, then electrons can move around. You have a conductor, so there is not much resistivity. If the band is completely filled, then the electrons cannot move around because there's a gap to the next level. So, so it doesn't matter. The velocity, in some sense, is zero. And to make the electrons move, you have to tunnel, which means you know that plastic can conduct electricity, that's called failure, it burns out. And if one put the numbers in, you realize that these two can differ by factors of trillion trillion. Similar principle gives us lasers. So this is how bands form. In lasers also, solid state laser, you use these bands to somehow excite an electron to upper up level, and then it falls back, it gives you back the light. And that's, that's the principle that this green light that's coming out is using. There is indium gallium arsenide here where the band gap is such that you get this green light out. And these are things we take for granted. But we take, in classical physics, there is no way you can get something like that. Okay? You need these bands, and you need the current kind of band filling. So talking about transistor, I could not help but show you this uh, quote from Wolfgang Pauli, who was a very, very famous theoretical physicist who claimed to have um, invented both solid state physics and semiconductor physics. But then as an advice, he said, no one should ever work on semiconductors. Uh, this was in 1931. This is a field image. Who knows if they really exist? So these band cycle calculations showed that there are materials, metals, where the band is partially filled, insulators, where they have a large band gap. And then there are materials where the band gap is small. And very smart people, people like Langmuir and others, immediately realized that if you have band, small band gap, 
then maybe you can keep create things like vacuum tubes in the laboratory by applying a strong electric field. So if you apply a strong electric field, you can invert the band. And if the band gap is small, not invert, by uh, um, um, incline the bands. If the band gap is small, then maybe you can have a little bit of current here just by applying external electric field. So you can, you can change the system from an insulator to a metal if the gap is small enough. So that's a semiconductor. So once semiconductors are predicted, silicon, people immediately actually started trying to create this uh, transistor action, vacuum tube action, by, and, and it didn't work. They did not work at all. They all failed. And the people were not quite sure what was going on. People thought maybe quantum mechanics is not quite working. And Paul, in his inimicable way, had this, uh, I would say, pretty um, strange kind of statement that may, may not, they may not even exist. Now, of course, we know wrong. What was wrong was that the semiconductor surfaces were not very good quality. Surfaces had a lot of defects. So the electrons that would have moved around, around in my computer now, they're all getting trapped in these defects. So basically, the subject then became the correct subject, you know, the bands, you started seeing the bands when you removed all those uh, surface states, so with material science. So silicon, as you know, is the most important element. We think most important element is oxygen, but actually silicon is the most important element in modern world. And uh, that is because the processors that go into computers are made of silicon. So this is the Pentium chip. It's, it's, it's a chip that I have inside my computer, and I think the chip I have in my computer has almost one billion transistors inside it. And uh, I do not know if any of you looked into the details of a Pentium processor. If you look at it, the engineering design of a Pentium processor is just truly unbelievable. In this little piece, you have one billion distinct components which are all working in unison. When I started looking into it in the context of my preparing public lectures, I was incredibly impressed. You know, often we physicists, particularly theoretical physicists, if you say that's just engineering, that's like the ultimate insult, you know, saying that's just engineering, you know, as if that just closes the issue. It cannot be difficult or important or interesting. But anybody who has looked into what goes into building a Pentium chip or any kind of chip is just truly unbelievable. And this, of course, all works on silicon you know, silicon and quantum mechanical properties of silicon, the fact that silicon is a transistor. And you know about Moore's law. So this thing has been going up. The number of transistors per chip, they have been doubling every two years. Actually, this doubling that is going down a little bit. And in around 2024, it will kind of saturate. But I have this picture up to 2000. And uh, it keeps on improving the number of chips on a, on, a, on, a, on a processor. And a better way of thinking about it is, the calculations you can do per second per every thousand dollar. Okay? This is actually a much better way of thinking about it. And if you look at those numbers, those numbers are going up also. They, are, they go up, I think, by a factor of four. So in the last 30 years, this is only up to 2000, but this trend has continued to 2012. It's slowing down though. In the last 30 years, computer performance per dollar has improved more than a million fold. Uh, this, is, this is truly an unbelievable claim. Why is it an unbelievable claim? Let's look at some other technology. Take your favorite technology. Bridges. You know, bridges are fabulous things. You can have a, you can have a five mile long bridge. Bridges today are built more or less on the same principle the Greeks and the, not the Greeks, the Romans built. So bridge, a technology, make, building bridges, they have not improved in, in more than a thousand years. Materials have improved, so you may be, you know, they may be slightly more structurally sound. But the basic bridge technology, not only that it, it, they don't improve factor of two every year, you cannot build a bridge that's 1,000 miles long today. You know, Romans could build bridges that are one mile. Maybe we can build bridges that are three miles. So bridge technology has not improved. It has improved very little. It has not improved at all in the last 100 years. So most technologies just quickly saturate and do not go anywhere. Let's take some other example. You know, example of a bri building bridges may, you may not find very impressive. But let's take that technology of aviations. Technology of building airplanes. Um, so, you know, the, the crowning success of avionics technology was 747, this huge jumbo jets which can carry 500 to 600 people. And uh, airplane technology basically saturated at that point. When was jumbo jet, this 747, when did that come out? 1965. Technologies do not, the same, the same is true for uh, rockets with liquid f fuel in there. So, it's untrue, you know, this thing. It's totally amazing. Most technologies do not change at all. There is a quick improvement, and then the saturate, 
and nothing much happens unless knowledge changes completely, okay? So this is an astonishing thing. If you start from his, you know, we had very little power with mechanical calculators and electromagnetic logic, but once these transistors came in, which work on quantum mechanical principle, it just keeps on going up. Let me tell you that uh, after 2024, this may saturate, and there is a huge push, at least in the United States, uh, how to go beyond this limit, which will, will hit in 2024. Now, why is it going to hit a limit? Because all you are doing is you're making the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller. You can't make them much smaller than, you know, some, there is some size limit. For example, obviously your transistors cannot be smaller than one angstrom, because the atoms are larger than one angstrom. So here is how the size is going down per unit, you know, per transistor. So in 2000, we're already somewhat smaller than the size of a virus. Now you're a factor of 10 smaller than the size of a virus, okay? So here, now the size is, let me see, now the size is uh, the, the current node, the current transistor that are being built, the size is 200 angstroms. So a few more generations and you'll be at 50 angstrom level and that will be about it. After that, you are talking about size of molecules and atoms, you can't be much smaller than that. And then the silicon technology will come to an end. We have to think of something new and people are actually thinking of new things. For example, I'm funded to work on topological insulators and graphene, thinking maybe they will give something new. We do not know what the new thing would be, but this technology is coming to an end. So let me show you the first transistor. This is the first transistor, which, is, uh, which used to be in, in, the, in the main lobby of Bell Labs in Murray Hill. I don't know if he's still there. And it's kind of this, this big. It was made of germanium. So, so it's, it's of the order of the size of a foot or something like that, you know, half a meter. From that, we are talking about, in, that was 1948. So from that, in 1948, we are now at 200 angstroms in 2012. This is an incredible accomplishment. And again, this thing works because of quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics plays a very important role. This is, in fact, the first integrated circuit made by uh, noise. And it also was this big. And uh, he was asked when he was given the Nobel Prize uh, whether they ever thought that this would amount to anything. He said he had no idea this would ever lead to anything. He had this, the, the new idea going from a transistor to a, an integrated circuit, which took about 10 years, was that you can take a single piece of semiconductor, silicon, let's say, and you can just create the transistor right on top of it, which how do you to combine many, many transistors together? And this, of course, turned out to be a revolutionary idea which allowed uh, uh, this transistor technology to improve by a factor of two, basically from this point and is still continuing. So the size, this is the technology node. Uh, the prediction is that you're going to reach 200 angstrom in 2016, 2018. People are working on that. We are already here, 340 angstrom. The current features are 340 angstrom, 34 nanometer. People are already working on, on, on 20 nanometer node, and then there is one more which is 10, and after that, the roadmap comes to an end. It's, it's not clear what to do beyond 100 angstrom feature size. This is all uh, quantum mechanical transistor motion. We know that electrons also have spin, which is a purely quantum mechanical property. Uh, spin could be up or down, two-state quantum system, and all magnetic properties arise from spin. And so, uh, so magnetism would not be possible without quantum mechanics. So the point is that you can have spin randomly, it's a non-magnet, you can have partial magnet, you can have a full ferromagnet, or you can have paramagnet, which is the spin is unmagnetized. And this leads, of course, to all the magnetic uh, industry. Uh, for example, your, you know, the reason computers can be this small is because the read head there's a revolutionary here, and this was the Nobel Prize a few years ago, uh, where the giant magnetic resistance technique was used, which is the quantum mechanical property. What happens is that resistance of this device, this is three metal. Two of them are magnetized. If the magnetic direction, the spins are oriented in the same direction, then the resistance is very small. If the spins are oriented in the opposite direction, the resistance is very large. And you can use this to create read heads, and this allowed suddenly the feature side to shrink enormously. And this is actually what is instrumental for today's computers or today's devices being very, very small. In fact, we have now gone beyond this. Now people are doing spin torque device, which is still smaller. Again, this is a quantum property because resistance now depends on whether, whether resistance of this inside, this is sandwich structure, resistance here depends on whether these two spins are aligned in the same direction or opposite direction. 
Uh, people are thinking about devices there where you use what is called spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling is a quantum mechanical property where the spin of an electron couples to its orbital motion. And if the spin couples to the orbital motion, then what happens is that if you apply an electric field, there's an effective magnetic field because of the spin orbit coupling. And there are all kinds of proposals, I'm not going to get into the details of that, where you can use the spin orbit coupling, the fact that spin and orbit coupled together, so the spin is precessing there, to create all kinds of devices. This is a very big subject. This subject is connected with topological insulator, connected with quantum spin hall effect, and in fact it's connected with something that's even more bizarre than that that I have been involved with. We recently showed, I'm not going to get into any of the details in a public lecture, that spin orbit coupling can be used if you include superconductivity also, if you put a superconductor nearby, then the spin orbit coupling can be used to create these particles which are called Mayorana fermion. So Mayorana fermions are particles which are their own antiparticles. So they are very strange object. And as you know, uh, in nature, fermions come in two flavors. For electron, there is positron. Uh, for neutrons, there is anti-neutron. For proton, there is anti-proton. Now, in, in the world of fermions, we know of no, no um, elementary particle which is its own antiparticle. For bosons, it's very easy. Most bosons are their own antiparticle. Photon is its own antiparticle. So if you're a boson, being your own antiparticle is, is the natural thing. But for fermions, that's unheard of. So these Meorana particles are their own antiparticle. They were postulated by Ettore Meorana, a great Italian theoretical physicist in 1930s. They have never been seen. A big experiment is going on to check whether neutrinos are Mayorana particles or not. But we pointed out that by combining spin orbit coupling and a magnetic field and a superconductor, so you need three elements, spin orbit coupling, magnetic field, and a superconductor, you can create Mayorana particles in your laboratory routinely. Okay? And this was just a theoretical prediction based on quantum mechanics of combining superconductivity, magnetic field, and spin orbit coupling. But uh, so, you know, so this is the Mayorana fermion. They are their own antiparticles, so this is a very interesting object. It turns out, apart from being quite interesting, these Mayorana particles can also be used for quantum computation. You can build a very good, very sophisticated quantum computer using Mayorana particles, so there's a lot of interest in it. And uh, let me not get into the details of how the Mayorana particle comes out of this superconductor magnetic field and spin orbit coupling. Maybe if somebody asks, I can describe that later on. Basically, technical thing is that you have to lift something called fermion doubling. In quantum field theory, fermions are always doubled. You know, if you have spin up, you must have spin down. It's sometimes called Kramer's theorem. And if you have fermion doubling, the free Mayorana particles cannot exist. But we showed how you can eliminate this fermion doubling by having these three things together. And after we made this proposal, Experimental is actually created this indium antimonide nanowire exactly following the prescription we had in our theory paper that use an indium antimonide nanowire, apply a magnetic field along the wire, put it on a superconductor, and then look at it by doing tunneling measurement. So in Delft, Leo Pohnheaven's group made this system. Here is a indium antimonide nanowire. Here is a superconductor. Here's a tunneling contact to measure things. I'm not going to discuss any details. They measure transport properties of the system. And what we predicted was that there'll be this peak at zero bias. At zero voltage, there'll be a peak. That's exactly what we predicted. And they saw that peak. And let me just show you that theory predicted this peak. Here is a theory showing this peak. And it, this is this peak. This theory came before experiment, two years before experiment. Here's the peak. And this peak is exactly what they saw experimentally. So this is now very popular. If you look on the web, that uh, it's thought that this Mayorana particle has finally been discovered in the laboratory. It's a very big subject because it has there's the possibility of doing quantum computation with it. Unfortunately, I cannot describe any of the details of it. But again, this is, uh, this is an aspect of quantum mechanics, which is very bizarre, that you can create fermions which are their own antiparticles. So I have been spending this whole time, half an hour or so, telling you how Quantum mechanics is all around us. Everything we use is dominated by quantum. Uh, everything we hope to use in the future, quantum computer and whatnot, is dominated by the quantum. So quantum is very, very real. Our everyday life depends entirely on quantum. Whether you're using a smartphone, or you are having a CAT scan done, or whether you're using this laser, they're all quantum. Without quantum, then none of them will be possible. But the problem has been that the great stalwarts who created quantum mechanics, and many people after that, feel that quantum mechanics is 
very mysterious. So let me give you this quote from Richard Feynman. This is a beautiful book, by the way, for the students to read. Really beautiful book. So Richard Feynman said in 1965, you know, Feynman is very well known for his Feynman lectures, which are, uh, which are uh, very serious physics books. This is more his musing on physics, but it's really wonderful to see how he uh, thought about physics. So Feynman says, and I'm going to read, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like. If you simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful entrancing things. Do not keep saying to yourself if you can possibly avoid it, but how can it be like that? Because you will get down in a drain into a blind alley from which nobody has yet escaped. Nobody knows how it can be like that. This is an incredible statement. I, I, I told you that quantum mechanics is verified to like 15 decimal places. I just told you that quantum mechanics dominates everything we use, our real world. But here is Richard Feynman, one of the smartest physicists ever, saying nobody understands quantum mechanics, you know, which he's saying he did not understand quantum mechanics. So what is going on? Why, why do people say that? And, and uh, Einstein said something even more dramatic, which everybody now knows, you know, uh, this famous quote from him, subtle is the Lord, but malicious is not. What he's alluding to is this lack of understanding of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is very impressive, but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing. That theory produces a good deal, but hardly brings us closer to the secret of the old one. Okay? He's saying that there is no understanding in it. It's a recipe that works. It's an algorithm that gives the right result. You know? But why it works, you do not understand. I'm at all events convinced that he does not play dice. Uh, Einstein died thinking there is a theory underlying quantum mechanics because he had this difficulty understanding quantum mechanics. I'll try to explain to you what happens. I would venture to say that it's really, I know because this is being taped and everybody will see it, but I'd venture to say that these great physicists were simply wrong. It's, it's quantum mechanics was too young at that time, and when a subject is very young, it's kind of difficult to understand. And there's a very famous paper by John Bell, which I'll discuss a little bit, not in great length, which kind of showed the things that bothered these people. The specific thing that bothered these people, and hopefully by the end of this talk, I have made clear what bothered them. Really not problems at all. They are true facts. You know, you can't be bothered by facts. It's like being bothered by, which I am, to tell you the truth, as I get more older, I get more bothered. It's like being bothered by that one day will die. Okay, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a fact. You have to accept it. So whatever is bothering them, this thing that they said, they are facts. They are part of quantum mechanics. So being bothered by them doesn't help at all. You have to just accept them, and I'm going to explain what I'm saying. So what are the main features of quantum mechanics? One is the principle of superposition, that a system can exist in superposition of states. Quantum mechanics goes through states. So a system can be in state A, B, C, D. Classical mechanics, you have to be either in state A, or in state B, or in state C, or in state D. In quantum mechanics, all those four states, you have to take a linear superposition. Then there is quantum entanglement, that this I'm going to explain in some more details. Then there is quantum uncertainty. This is the easiest thing to understand. In fact. There is no big deal about quantum uncertainty at all. And then there are things outside the Schrodinger equation, wave function collapse, quantum jumps, decoherence. So the mysterious parts really are this four and two, which are connected. One and three really doesn't have anything mysterious about them. So let me explain what I'm saying. So quantum uncertainty, Heisenberg uncertainty, a lot of nonsense has been written by Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and Heisenberg himself contributed to that. Heisenberg uncertainty actually can be completely understood even in classical terms. So what we are saying is that you can't measure velocity and position both with infinite precision, or energy and time, or spin in different directions. You can write down an explicit relationship, which says that the uncertainty in position and uncertainty in momentum, their product must be larger than this fundamental constant, h. And this is always true. h is very, very small. Planck constant is very tiny in ordinary units. In our everyday life scale, it's very small. So because it's very small, you know, you think that you see me right here, but in reality, I'm not right here, my position is uncertain by this small amount. This is so small that it doesn't show up. So this is why real world, you don't see the uncertainty. But if you go to the world of electron, electron size is this small, this fuzziness becomes very important. So a big deal was made of this by philosophers, and people still make a big deal of it. But I would say this is really a very trivial feature of, of Fourier analysis. Okay? So uh, it's, it's essentially what it is is that, this is not a big deal at all. So if you take 
if you look at it mathematically, this is exactly what you expect, that, that the, the, the a Fourier spectrum, the Fourier space and real space, their product has to be of order one, and because there's you know, the momentum and position are canonical variables, this follows immediately, and, and the confusion arises from trying to use ordinary English language to describe this. So I'd say that there's nothing fancy or deep or uh, really mysterious or bizarre about, about, uh, about uncertain principle, except for the fact that, of course, it's not obvious in a, in a large object because the quantum is so small, H is so small. Now, superposition is somewhat more difficult to understand. So, so I'm going to explain uh, a superposition by uh, quoting a very famous philosopher, Yogi Berra, who was actually a baseball player, but he was one of those um, wise men who make these single statements which have become very popular. Apparently he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. So let's say you come to a fork, so you have a road, fork, and classical world, if you are driving a car, even in Mumbai, where Jim was making fun of Mumbai driving, but even in Mumbai, when you come to the intersection, you've got to decide whether you're going to go left or right. Even in Mumbai, you cannot go in both directions. Okay? So this is the classical world. It appears completely obvious that when you come to a fork, you have to take either left or right. You cannot follow yoga bearers. What happens quantum mechanically? Quantum mechanically, both are allowed. Okay? You can come here and you can split yourself and go through both parts. You can go left and right simultaneously at the same time. This is the quantum superposition. And this is difficult to understand classically. You only if you think of the electrons as particles or quantum objects as particles. If you think of it as a wave, a wave when it hits, hits an obstacle always splits and goes around. So if you think of quantum property as wave property, this is obvious. This is what you expect. And, and uh, when something is very small, there is a difference between wave and particle. The reason we have two different English words or two different Bengali words for wave and particle is because language is evolutionary. It evolves, language evolves to describe things we can see with our eyes. Language, if electrons develop language, then wave and particle will have exactly the same word describing them. Because to an electron, there is no difference between wave and, wave and particle. They're the same thing. To us, wave and particle are very different because, you know, for us, uncertainty is very small. And so this thing arises from the fact that in the classical world, you, when you go through two slits, you can only go either on the left so you'll see a pattern like this, or on the right when you see a pattern like this, and if you combine the two, you get a whole pattern which is like that. Classically, a particle can only go through the left or the right, but we know that if we send light through this thing, then light creates a beautiful interference pattern because light can go through, wave can go through either this one or that one, water will also form a beautiful pattern. So this is very common. So if you think of electron as a wave, this is exactly what you expect, and, and, uh, and this is because of the property of the wave that waves have crests and troughs, and what you're adding is amplitude, not probability, not the square, you're adding amplitude. So when the phases are in, in when the crests and troughs are in phase, it, amplitude becomes very large. When they're exactly opposite to each other, it becomes zero. And so classical particle will have just no interference pattern, just a maxima. Waves will have some kind of pattern. And what happens with quantum particle? I just told you that electrons are both particles and waves. This was known the moment Schrodinger equation came out. You can do an experiment. You can take electron and send it through slits. This experiment is routinely done all over the world. You can do it with even atoms. And what do you see? If you have very few electrons, you only see a few random dots. Then if you, you know, this is a fascinating experiment to do. It's quite, I mean, I get the goosebump. It, it, then if only a few more, there is no regular pattern, but as you put more and more and more electrons, eventually what you find, a pattern emerges, and you see a nice interference pattern, which is exactly what waves say. So experiment clearly decides electrons can work as waves. This is, this is the proof, and, and the reason you don't see me as a wave is because the, my de Broglie wavelength is very, very small. My de Broglie wavelength is 10 to the minus 40 meter. So you have to be able to resolve that small length scale to see ordinary objects as waves. But the electron is very small. De Broglie wavelength is only 10 to the minus 11 meter. So you can diffract it with slits. You cannot diffract me with slits because you need a very, very small slit, much smaller than you know, a fraction of a nucleus. So these are some actual images. See, this is pretty old. Hitachi 1989, the experiment that I showed you, few electrons, a few more, two slit. And with a lot of electrons, you see nice pattern. This is from Bologna, even older than this. So these things are routinely seen, and they look just like. Now, suppose you now try to detect which path the electron goes through. 
right? We just, because electron can be particle also, they don't have to be just wave. So you put a detector right here. You put a detector right here, you ask the question, if the detector clicks, the electron has gone through there, and then you know what happens. You just get two patterns, they start behaving like particles. So somehow, electron knows where it's going through. If you try to detect which slit it's going through, it then behaves like a particle. That's, that's what quantum mechanics loss says, and that's exactly what experimentally is seen. That if the moment you try to detect, if you're not detecting which slit it goes through, it shows you nice wave property, but the moment you try to detect, it gives you particle properties. Now, very recently, this experiment has been done. There have been claims. I'm going to show you some very recent stuff, like the Merona Fermi, and I'm going to show, show you three very recent stuff, so that those of you who are physicists who are here are not totally bored by it. There are these experiments done in Toronto, but the claim is that this experiment was done, and in spite of the experiment that is looking at which slit the electrons are going through, they found that there is still some wet pattern left in the experiment. That was the claim. So you can look them up, and it really got written up everywhere. So um, using photon, quantum mechanics get weirdly less weird. They are talking about that, uh, that Heisenberg uncertainty proof is proven false. Okay, very big claim. I did not pay much attention to this, these things, uh, 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 but in the end, now it turns out that there is no problem here, nothing is false, it's just the way wash measurement was done, the, the specific details of the measurement, you should see a little bit of the wave property also, because they're doing a weak measurement, not a strong measurement. When you do a weak measurement, some aspect of the wave property should stay there. So off and on, somebody will do an experiment and claim quantum mechanics is not quite working the way it's supposed to, then when you look at depth, you find a perfectly reasonable explanation, and this turned out to be one of those things. This is you know, September 2012, very recent stuff. So this is, you know, so uh, quantum mechanics, if you have n slits, the wave will go through all the slits, you have to add all the amplitude. This is what Feynman meant when he said that, add all the paths, and then if you want to see which slit, you go to that slit, and you put a detector there, then it collapses you to the wave function on that slit, then you only see that. This is called the wave function collapse. And this is what bothered Einstein, because Einstein said if it's going through all the slits, it should not matter which slit I'm looking at. It turns out it does matter. And he found this unacceptable, this collapse of the wave function. So specifically, a general superposition state invariably collapses into a measured state with probability of this amplitude square, as if the measurement process, example, looking at which slit, creates a specific reality of the ith state, okay? And this sometimes is called many words interpretation, that, that all the slits are real, and all of them are different universes, and all of those universes are in parallel to each other, and the, this is called many words interpretation of quantum mechanics. To me, that's just an, a tautology. Uh, this explanation and that explanation are equivalent, saying there are many words really doesn't improve our understanding anymore. Now, you may ask the question, this is, the third thing I'm telling you that's very recent. I'm, I'm telling you three things from 2012. You may ask, every textbook in quantum mechanics uses this two-slit interference. If you look at Feynman's lectures, he does all of quantum mechanics with two-slit. What happens if you have three-slit or four-slit? Is there a difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics? I told you that for two-slit, there is a very big difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. Classical mechanics gives you one peak or two peaks, just a Gaussian distribution. And quantum mechanics gives you well-defined interference pattern. So there's a huge difference, fundamental difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics if you do, if you do um, uh, two-slit interference. What happens if you do three-slit interference, four -slit interference? Does anybody here know the answer? It turns out that quantum mechanics is minimal. People have generalized quantum mechanics is three slit, four slit, it turns as minimal. It's, it's, if you do a three slit experiment, then classical and quantum mechanical results are identical. Okay, I mean, I'm not gonna go into the details, but you can, you can like basically logic, you know, if you're keeping all three slits open, you can show classically. So it doesn't matter whether you're talking in terms of probability or you're talking in terms of amplitude. That, that's what I mean by classical and quantum mechanical interpretation are the same. So you can do an experiment. It, the same is true for four slit, okay, classical. You can, and, and so quantum mechanics is minimal, okay, just, so rules of the game are the same, and it turns out people have done experiments. So nothing, there is nothing new beyond two slit. Okay, no multi-path interference beyond just double path interference. So you have to take all the two path interferences together, but you don't have to take interference for three paths interfering together. And people have done experiments. This paper came out in Science in 2010, uh, uh, ruling out multi-order interference in quantum mechanics. They actually did an experiment, multi-slit experiment, and showed that it's 
I mean, people of goodwill could kind of disagree on how convincing this experiment is. But I think this is a very bold attempt. I would not have known about it, except both the first author and the senior author you know, spent a lot of time explaining the details of this to me, so I had to look into it. And uh, you know, they literally created a multi-split multi -split system, passed photon through it, and showed that classical and quantum results, classical result agrees with the experiment, as it should. So keep that quantum mechanics is minimal. You do not have, people have developed theories. I think this uh, Rafael Sorkin has created theories for multipath interference, and that's, quantum mechanics doesn't obey that. So basic thing is that when you have interference, you do expect interference pattern. And whether it's water or electron wave doesn't make any difference. It will show you interference pattern. This is the reality. And these are actually even more beautiful pictures of interference of iron atoms on copper surface. So this is a beautiful STM picture. These are iron atoms on surface of copper. And so how beautiful the, the uh, you, you can, this is on the web, you can get it from IBM STM gallery. Uh, STM, the specific, specifically looking at quantum interference pattern. So this is, for example, a simulation of what you expect, and this is the actual experimental data. See, beautiful interference pattern of this, I think, tungsten or iron, maybe. And even more beautiful is the interference of uh, bosonic condensates, right? This is the Nobel Prize that uh, uh, Cornell and uh, uh, they got in, 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 um, um, in, for their work in 1995, where they saw bosonic interference, and you are seeing interference pattern. This is the constructive interference giving you very large peak, destructive interference giving you nothing, and this sort of uh, BEC condensation, this is better wave. Each of these waves have maybe 10,000 atoms in them. But this 10,000 atom is like one quantum state because the bosonic condensate is a BEC, it's a bose einstein condensate, it's completely phase coherent. So these 10,000 atoms together working like one atomic particle, and then you are seeing the interference pattern of this particle. It's beautiful, beautiful. This is not routine. In, in, in atomic physics, people do this kind of condensates, do experiments with all the time. Nobody thinks about the mystery of quantum mechanics. This is just the tool for doing things, okay? So quantum mechanics is just, you know, quantum Schrodinger equation is a very simple equation. It's a second order partial differential equation. Second order partial differential equations are what we call dime a dozen in engineering and applied mathematics. It's a, it's a very trivial equation. So there is nothing mysterious about this equation. Mystery comes from the fact that what you'd get when you do the measurement, and that's what the big deal comes in. Since wave function collapse, what you get when you do the measurement is not in this equation. It comes from this fact that when you measure, you are measuring that particular slip. This is why Schrodinger himself, it's a great tragedy, Schrodinger himself never believed in his equation. Because Schrodinger lost great, along with me, Einstein being the last great classical physicist, had a very mechanistic interpretation of his equation. He thought of his equation really like an equation in applied math, which describes normal modes of a drum or something like that. And he did not like this collapse at all. So that's where all these different things comes from. All the mysteries, all the bizarre everybody's talking about comes from the fact that when you're doing measurement, you're collapsing the wave function, okay? So the question that a lot of people have worried about, this was Einstein's great worry, is can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? So you have to define, you know, we are not philosophers, we are physicists, we have to define, uh, there are two loaded words here, one is reality and one is complete. Einstein, as usual, as, usual, as you'd expect Einstein to do, gave an absolutely succinct, absolutely succinct definition of reality. You know, Einstein was not only one of the greatest physicists ever, arguably perhaps the great physicist along with Newton, you know, these are the two that compete. If you rank physicists, then these are the two who are which are competing. He also wrote incredibly well. I mean, everything he wrote was just, you know, just what is needed, nothing more, nothing less. So he defined reality. So he said every element of the physical reality must have a counterpart in the physical theory. So if you have an equation and you're measuring something in experiment, each quantity in this experiment that you measure must correspond to something in your equation. And then he went on, if without in any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty, that is probability equal to one, the value of a physical quantity, then there must exist an element of physical reality with respect to that quantity. I mean, if you read, you know, this is, looks like a philosophical statement, but it's really a very precise statement of how physics was done in the classical world. Einstein is absolutely right in what he says here. And if you take this as a definition of reality, then quantum mechanics does not describe reality. 
We now know this definition of reality is too narrow, it's too incomplete. Okay? And so we are going to try to understand how what John Bell basically showed that this definition does not work. John Bell showed this definition. This is a naive classical view of reality. And so let me just tell you the, the so-called EPR paradox. I'm not going to talk about Bell's work. It's just too complex to describe in this short time. But let me talk about just the EPR paradox. It's not a paradox at all. I don't know why people call it paradox. EPR, Gedanken experiment, although the experiment has been done. Imagine a system, which is a composite system, and you have two, you have two uh, uh, objects which are spin, both can be spin up or spin down together. So think of this as a molecule with two atoms. Each atom can have spin up or spin down. So this is a molecule. And what you're going to do is you're going to put this in some state and then you're going to take them very far away from each other. So let's say the initial state is the white atom in up spin and the brown, the brown atom in down spin. Perfectly well defined situation. Okay, this is your first state. So this is a singlet. This is called a singlet. This is a singlet molecule. Okay. Then what you're going to do is that you're going to now take these two atoms very far from each other, very far, you know, next galaxy. It's a Gedanken experiment, remember. But in laboratory, people have done experiments pretty close to this. So you move this one very adiabatically very far and move this one very adiabatically very far. And you do that without any interference from anything else in your laboratory. Again, in real life, there'll be some interference. But as a matter of principle, I can certainly think that I do it totally isolated from everything else. Then, you, what you do is that you measure the spin of this object, and if you find it to be up, then you immediately know this spin is down, correct? Because the total spin is zero, you have not affected anything, spin is conserved. So if this spin is up, this spin has to be down. Einstein was very bothered by it. How many in this room are very bothered by it? Okay. This is the popular interpretation of EVA paradox. Nobody should be bothered by it at all. This is exactly what happened in classical physics also. Exactly the same thing. Okay? Well, let's say that I am one of those crazy professors who wear yellow socks in one foot and pink socks in the other foot. That's what I always do. Okay? And I leave one sock here and then I go over to the next galaxy and then you measure my sock here to be yellow. Then you know I'm wearing pink socks very far away. There is nothing mysterious about it because this is a causal relationship. Relationship does not change because I... So if this was the whole story that you measure spin up there and spin down here, there is nothing mysterious here. So most popular books on this EPR paradox, what they say is just completely false. This is exactly what would happen classically also. Exactly the same thing would happen. Because it's like I take two pieces of paper. On one I write up, on one I write down. And I ask you to come and take a piece of paper. You just take the piece of paper, you go away somewhere else. And after you have gone away, I look at which paper I have. I see that it says down. I know you have the paper that says up. There is nothing, you know, there is nothing mysterious about it. That's exactly what you expect. But there is something else one can do with spin. Spin, you do not have to measure spin just in up direction. You can decide after taking the atom very far away that you don't feel like measuring the spin in the z direction. You're going to measure the spin in the x direction. Because that's your decision in the other universe. Now there is a problem. Now there is no way for this object to know which way you're measuring the spin here. Because that is a choice you made in a different galaxy, remember? But magically, if you measure the spin to be oriented along this direction here, this spin magically will be oriented that direction. This is very mysterious. So Einstein's point was that he has no problem that spin up could be implies spin down. But what if I decide to measure the spin in some other direction? then how does this one know that I'm doing that measurement there? So his view was, since this measurement with 100% probability, you can predict what this spin is. You're doing a measurement here, and with 100% probability, you can predict what the measurement to give here. The spin in x direction must have always been there as a property of this object. But we know that's impossible, because if you measure spin in z direction and spin in x direction, they're incompatible. They're connected by heisenberg hansard relation. So if you spin, define spin in z direction, you cannot define in x direction. So Einstein said, ha ha, this is not allowed. Look, here is an experiment where with 100% probability I can find the spin in x direction. So obviously spin in x direction was somehow hidden. It must be a hidden variable of some kind. And in fact, you can measure the spin in some arbitrary direction, not in x or z, some tilted direction. Again, if you measure to mean the tilted direction to be down here, it's going to be up there. So it looks like it's instantaneous action, action at a distance because you can choose to do this measurement many hours after you have divided them. 
And the moment you do the measurement, magically this one decides which way it is going to orient. How does this thing know what measurement you are making there? It looks like instantaneous action at a distance. This is called entanglement, by the way. And so Einstein said this is not description of reality. Reality doesn't work that way. If, if this is this way, it must have been this way forever in some hidden manner. And this was what Einstein was talking about. And this is missed in most popular books on this. That the important thing here for spin is that you can choose what kind of measurement you want to do after you have separated them. And by some magic, this thing knows it, instantaneous action at a distance. Truth is, John Bell's work showed that reality is this way. This classical reality that Einstein thought of doesn't exist. There is no reality until you look. Reality is imparted by looking. And in David Marmon's words, there is really no moon when no one is looking. You know, to, to see something, you have to look at it. It's a very bizarre thing if you use classical physics. But why should you use classical physics trying to understand quantum mechanics? OK, there is no reason to. Okay, so. So if you look at the equation, there is no problem. Schrodinger came up with uh, a little bit right after, around the same time, in fact, also in 1935. Schrodinger came up with a different kind of paradox, which is called Schrodinger's cat paradox. This bothers a lot of people. Of all the people I know personally, you know, I grew up in a quantum mechanical culture. And I did not know anybody, people like Jim or my friend Steve Garvin, we never worry about quantum mechanics. Because we are quantum mechanicians. We do quantum mechanics every day for 10, 12, 15 hours. You know, we know it works very well. And I know there are some people who worry about quantum mechanics being, you know, whether it's real or whether it's what, very deep issues. But most of them are dead. So I never met them, you know, Schrodinger, Einstein, never met them. Feynman, never met them. So I never came across any serious person who worries about meaning of quantum mechanics and so on. Until recently. Now a lot of people are worrying about it. First serious person who put some doubt in my thought that maybe it's not the realm of just crazy and dead people. Maybe it's, it's Tony Leggett. Tony Leggett is an incredibly, he not only won a Nobel Prize, but he's an incredibly deep physicist, theoretical physicist. He was giving a talk somewhere. This is in early 2000. And after the talk, I told him, Tony, if I didn't know you very well, I would have said that you are telling me you don't believe in quantum mechanics. He said, yes, I don't believe in quantum mechanics. That shut me up. Okay. He is very bothered by this thing. This, this uh, paradox. So Schrodinger's cat paradox is, it's very easy to state, but it's actually pretty profound. So Schrodinger, to make his point, created a diabolical machine where there is a cat connected with a vial of uh, cyanide, which can break and make the cat die. And the whole thing is enclosed in some chamber. You cannot look at it. And there is a radioactive material which can emit a little radiation randomly, because it's quantum mechanical, make this cyanide thing break and kill the cat. Or maybe it will not break, because there is a half-life, and the cat will be alive. So when you're not looking at it, your wave function of this system is cat is alive, and the detector off. The uh, radiation did not come out, or cat is dead and the detector on. This is your state. Then when you look at it, you see that cat is either dead or alive. So Schrodinger found this completely unacceptable because Schrodinger said, because this is not lack of knowledge. This is not like you don't know. Classically, the cat would be either dead or alive. You just don't know. Quantum mechanically, it's not that you don't know. The cat doesn't know whether it is really not dead or alive. It's a linear combination of the two. Schrodinger said this doesn't make any sense. And this is what bothers Tony Leggett also. He takes this paradox very seriously. And he really believes for macroscopic objects, we still do not know something. He believes that there is some finite number of microscopic objects beyond which quantum mechanics will fail, because he believes there is no suitable explanation for this Schrodinger's paradox. My own feeling is that you know I, I do not want to trivialize it. Uh, my own feeling is there is no paradox here at all. This is the way quantum mechanics works. If you can find a quantum cat, I will give you a cat that's both dead and alive. But the solving the problem of a cat is very non-trivial. Why? We are alive because of the sun. If the sun did not exist, you are not going to be alive. To solve this problem, you have to solve the problem of sun, cat, all these things combined. This problem is very, very difficult. This problem has many, 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 many solutions, almost infinite number of solutions. And what we'll find, all the spectral weight, all the weight, you know, astronomically large weight is in seeing the cat either dead or alive. Spectral weight in the linear combination of two is very, 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 very small. So there'll be no problem if you are willing to wait exponentially longer than the lifetime of the universe, maybe you will find a cat which is both dead and alive. But for all virtual purposes, this is an impossibility. This, but to solve this, you have to solve the problem of you know, this entangled object, sun, because life is a very complicated thing. 
But this is, you know, obviously meaningless classically, okay? So, Heisenberg spent a lot of time worrying about these things. He even said things like, um, uh, uh, what is that um, uh, this statement? That um, mechanical reality is exactly like the reality of trees and rocks, except you cannot use the description of the reality of trees and rocks to describe quantum mechanical reality. So, in a quantum world, we can have, basically, this is the key. In quantum world, you can have local reality, which is not objective. You can describe your problem just locally, but this reality will not be the classical reality. Or you can have reality, objective reality, which is not local. It's your choice. You cannot have both locality and reality. Now, most ordinary people would choose reality because most ordinary people don't care about locality. It turns out physicists, to physicists, localism is much more important than reality. So we choose locality. So I'm perfectly happy to say that classical reality is a figment of our imagination. There is no reality like classical world, okay? Because I want localism. So this is not strange at all. I mean, imagine, you know, the example I'll give, imagine that you are an ant, you know, literally an ant moving around on this, on this surface here. Ant has a reality, you know, ant has some kind of incentive understanding of the universe around it, because if it did not have an incentive understanding, it could not evolve. Ants have not evolved at all in last many millions of years. Ants actually understand reality much better than we do, because they don't even evolve anymore. So ant has a reality. That reality must be very, very different from the reality you and I have. There is no conceivable way we can even understand the reality an ant sees. If we cannot even understand the reality of an ant, we have no chance of understanding the reality of an electron. So I think this is chutzpah that we think somehow we should understand the reality of electron, except three equations. So we understand relative equation three electrons, but then you're using ordinary English language, you know, uh, superposition and collapse and things like that to understand it. So I'm more or less convinced that all of this arises from this language problem, that language evolves on our length scale and it's just in, insufficient to describe the reality of quantum mechanics. And so the dilemmas all arise from language. If you use the equation, there is no dilemma. But this is not a viewpoint shared universally. You know, uh, um, uh, as I told you, Tony Leggett doesn't agree with me. A, a very good experimentalist that I have come to know very, very well recently, Alan Aspey, who verified this Bell's inequality, was shocked hearing I feel that way. He told me, Shankar, I thought you were a smart guy. And after I told him that, he no longer thinks I'm a smart guy because I, I kind of feel that there is no problem with quantum mechanics. So as I told you, the tragedy, Einstein and Schrodinger, who created quantum mechanics, did not believe in quantum mechanics, okay? So Schrodinger said this astonishing thing in 1952. We never experimented just one electron or atom or small molecule. In thought experiment we do, in reality we're always looking at collections. So Schrodinger really believed all quantum mechanical statements are statistical statements in the classical sense. He was, of course, wrong. In 1952, you did not do experiments with single atoms, but two days ago on Monday, a Nobel Prize was given in, in Stockholm for doing experiments precisely with one atom. Dave Weinland and Sergei Harosh won the Nobel Prize for creating these cat states in the laboratory. They created precisely the states that bothered Schrodinger in the laboratory. Sergei Harosh created them with photons, and Dave Weinland created them with atoms. Precisely those states they created, and they were working with single atoms. Okay, single electron, something that Schrodinger thought would be impossible. And in fact, you know, they, you know this, this is exact, they both created cat states and the Nobel Prize is for creating cat states and they created these single, single atoms. So what Mr. Schrodinger said, he was simply wrong. You see, this is the problem of thinking something is impossible. Experimenters are incredibly innovative. Something is impossible today. If no principle stops it from happening, they're gonna make it happen next day, okay? So even with electron, this thing is routinely done in systems that Jim Eisenstein and I work in, in, in quantum dots, you can put an electron, you can take a system with two levels like this, and you can put the electron on the left or on the right. And as you know, quantum mechanics tells us the actual state, the ground state, is not the electron on the left or the electron on the right, but a linear combination of these two, because the electron can tunnel back and forth. And routinely these experiments are done. You know, you can go randomly to physical review later, there will be one physical review letter every month or somebody has done an experiment like this to see something else. So here is coherent manipulation of electronic states in a double dot experiment from Japan. And it's exactly the experiment I was talking about. Here is a left dot, here is a right dot, and they make the electron go back and forth and look at the linear combination of this state. Of course, I'm not going to discuss it in any kind of details, but these experiments are done routinely with single electron. So what I'm coming to the end, of course, so what is the meaning? What is the meaning of it all? Meaning of it all is that quantum mechanics cannot be both classically real and mathematically local. 
That's just a structure of the theory. It cannot be classically real and quantum. Classical reality is as Einstein defined it. Okay. Okay. This is now completely established without any question. So if you, if you are, if you insist on classical reality, so you say the moon is always there, then it is indeed true in quantum mechanics the moon is not there when you're looking at it. But the correct statement should be the electron is not there when you're not looking at it. Because moon is not a quantum mechanical object, it's a classical object. The moon is very much there when you're not looking at it. But electron is not there when you're look, not looking at it, because an electron follows quantum mechanics in a pristine form. So no classical model of reality would describe quantum mechanics. And there is no reason to expect it. There are different theories. Why should a classical model of reality describe quantum mechanics? And this dichotomy that measurement versus measured is a dichotomy that arises only in the theoretical realm. In real experiment, you always know what is being measured and what is doing the measuring. So this dichotomy is, 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 is a hypothetical problem and real life is not a problem. And you know, the, the list goes on, but all of them basically goes back to the fact that quantum mechanics works perfectly and something that works perfectly saying it, we do not understand it, is a bit, a bit perverse. So, Quantum mechanics rules modern technology. I'm coming to the end of my talk. Quantum mechanics rules modern technological reality. It's actually only the beginning. There's much more to come because the technology that we are using is a passive use of quantum mechanics. You know, transistor is a passive use of quantum mechanics. Magnetic disk is a passive use. When quantum computer comes, we are going to be using entanglement, superposition, these things themselves for our quantum principle. And these things are going to happen in the next 50 years. 50 years from now, people would look back and say, Oh, they were so dumb, they did not use entanglement to do anything practical. But it's going to happen, I have no doubt about it. Uh, but quantum reality remains intuitively elusive. It remains intuitively elusive in the same sense you and I have no intuitive understanding of the reality and ant sees. Well, it's actually worse than that because electron is much smaller than ant. So classical reality of Einstein is a pure fantasy. This is, this is just a wrong way of looking at things. So, uh, um, uh, you know, moon is really not there when you're looking at it. Entanglement, superposition, collapse, they may be mysterious if you insist on classical reality, but they're not mysterious at all. So, let me end by going back to classical physics. We all assume classical physics is intuitively obvious. Actually, classical physics to me is much more non-obvious than quantum physics. Much, much more non-obvious. And I'm, I'm not saying this just to make a point. I think the reason quantum mechanics appear so mysterious to us is because it's only a 100 year old subject. I don't know how many of you read Principia Mathematica of Newton. I actually read it. It's absurd. Reading it's almost impossible. Okay, it's, it's, uh, you know, classical mechanics is 400 years old. So we take many of the concepts as, oh, that's intuitive. That's because you have heard it many, many times. It took, it took 150 years, 150 years to derive the formula that kinetic energy is half mv squared from Newton's law, 150 years, okay? Even after the people were high, fighting whether the half is there or half is not there. This thing that you take as obvious or not obvious at all, okay? So let me give you some example. How intuitive is classical physics? Action at a distance in Newton's law, how intuitive is that? We know Newton told us that the earth goes around the sun in a particular elliptic orbit because of these Newton's laws, right? We take all, take it for granted. Oh, intuitive, oh, in Kepler's law follows from Newton's law, it's, you know. It's something that you do in 9th grade or 10th grade that Kepler's law follows directly from Newton's laws. How the hell does the earth know that the sun is there? Who tells the earth that it knows? If you think about it, it makes no sense whatsoever. None. So classical mechanics is no more intuitive than quantum mechanics. You know, we take things for granted, action at a distance. We say that you have to follow this rule, but the earth has to know somehow the sun is there. How does it know? You know, concept of classical gravitational electron magnetic field is extremely non-trivial. The concept of field is so non-trivial that classical physicists created a, 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 a hypothetical material called ether because they could not accept that they thought that field means it must permeate something, something must move. So they said there must be ether. You know, people as great as Maxwell. Now we know that there is no ether. We accept that, now we accept the concept of field, classical field, quantum field as a given. But it's not an intuitive concept at all. It's something we accept because experiment shows it's not there and because we had hundreds of years to follow it. So I would say that action at a distance, concept of classical gravitational magnetic field, inertial frame, no frame is inertial. There is no frame anywhere that's inertial, okay? Everything is accelerating at some stage. But we routinely use inertial frame to talk about things. It's non-intuitive. But it is going on for 400 years. Newton, by the way, knew how, how 
artificial inertial frame is. Okay, so you know, so as I said, how does the sun know the existence of the art and then to decide to attract it precisely the inverse square law to make it go around the sun in, a, in, in, in this elliptic pattern? I mean, this is, if you ask these questions, you'll find that these things are not very intuitive either. So I'm going to end by saying, you know, what is mysterious? Really, what is mysterious? And this is very difficult to explain to non-scientists. What is mysterious is not quantum mechanics or classical mechanics. What is mysterious is that nature follows laws. This is a mysterious thing. Nature follows laws, and we can actually figure out what those laws are. Every time I think about it, I literally get goosebumps. Why the hell should nature follow laws? You know, I can walk out of this road, I can decide to go eat dinner in a kebab place or a fish place or a vegetarian place. You know, I think I'm making a free decision. But somehow, natural laws, natural objects do not have that freedom. They must obey some equation that people have written down. This is very mysterious. Why nature follows laws, I think, is the most magical and most mysterious thing. And once you accept nature follows laws, once you accept this most magical of all statements, it's not so difficult to see why certain laws concept of reality is one kind and certain other laws concept of reality is some other kind. And with that uh, fake profound statement, I'm going to end. Thank you all very much for uh, your attention. Thank you, Shankar, for a very interesting talk. Uh, will you take a few questions? Absolutely. There are questions. I'm okay. happy to answer them. So, uh, if uh, people have a question, they just raise their hands uh, very high. Don't be shy, the students. All questions are good questions. Remember that. Shankar, you have answered all questions. Yeah, it was crystal clear, it looks like. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I do not think that precisely a single electron experiment can be done, with not with electron, with atoms, something like that has been done. This experiment, many of these experiments with Bell's inequality or this sort of thing that do photons, not electrons, because we have capability of measuring single photon rather easily. And controlling single electron to that level is not quite easy. So I do not think that experiment has been done with single electron. These experiments in Toronto that I was talking about, where they claim that uh, it's going through the slit thing doesn't quite work, they're with photons, not with electrons. Right. Oh, if you, if you have single electron going through a slit? Yes. If you, if you have two slits, and if you send a single electron, there'll be an interference pattern. It'll be just very, very weak. So if you have two slits, and you somehow manage to send a single electron, whatever that means, there'll be an interference pattern. Yes. That's what quantum mechanics tells you. Yes. If you are not looking at which slit it's going through, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Very weird, right? But you have to think of electron as a wave. Once you think of electron as a wave, its wavelength is given by that single electron's mass type velocity, h divided by that quantity, then it's just a wave. Even a single electron is a wave. It's just a very weak wave. Its intensity is very low, but it's a wave. And a wave will interfere with itself. Yes. That's what you are asking, right? Yeah. In yeah. your quantum me mechanical system, is the detector which sees, is it classical or quantum? Yeah, so this is, of course, this is, of course, the whole mystery of quantum mechanics, that this is what I mean by the dichotomy between measured and measured and measurer. And so all, all uh, statements about the measurement, we express, people would say classically. But the way I look at it is classically only because the, the measuring apparatus tends to be classical, you know, point or somewhere and so on. So the measuring apparatus typically is always classical, always classical, but it doesn't have to be that. I think in the future that's going to change. But right now, measuring apparatus is always classical. That's, that's the answer. And the way it's explained, of course, those are things I glossed over, is through the concept of decoherence. You know, concept of decoherence is a very powerful concept which takes you from the measure to the measurer. Measuring apparatus is classical. That's the answer to your question. Yes. Sir, you took that problem of care, and you say that uh, the, the linear combination of the, the, that particular uh, means the detector is 
the detector is off and uh, cat is alive right. and the detector is on and cat is dead correct. this is linear combination of the uh, um, and this is the solution correct then uh, is there any connection uh, means this uh, solution has an, uh, is there any connection uh, for solution and probability uh, because probability is uh, means uh, uh, quantum mechanics is statistical in nature and yes. probability plays a vital role correct. so is there connection between the solution and the probability yeah so the thing is that you can uh, if you do an experiment then you know the probability of which one would happen from the coefficient of those two terms okay so exactly as you said you have two terms one term is cat dead and the detector off on other term is cat alive detector off each term comes with a coefficient you solve the problem you know the coefficient so the probability of seeing this when you do the measurement is this square or seeing that is that square Okay. Okay. Means two mutually exclu uh, mutually exclusive events, and then the probabilities get added. Correct. And the whole probability will be one. That's oh, absolutely. That's the. But I would everything you say is correct, and I gave you an answer. Many of the problems arise in this quantum mechanical discussion because people often think of probability in quantum mechanics as identical to classical probability. It is not identical to classical probability because you know then they say, well, unless you do many, many, many measurements, it would not apply, and so on and so forth. It's a bit different. The probability here is psi square gives you the probability, so it's a bit different from classical probability. Okay. Yes, sir. Still, you not answer the question. Oh. At what level? The actually the transition occurs between classical and quantum systems. This. Despite adoptions in mind and experiment, at what level the Correct. collapse actually occurs, what level yeah. the equation is actually This is a very good question, and this is of course Tony Leggett's issue. So the question that is being asked, it's a very important question, is that and that goes back to the question asked before also, that if you have a quantum mechanical wave function, then you can then expand it. And you say, okay, let me expand that my quantum mechanical system. Let's include the apparatus into the quantum mechanical system. Okay, instead of calling the apparatus class that, then have a larger quantum system which has a wave function which evolves. Then you want to try to measure that something with something else. Let's include that, and it keeps on evolving. And if you look at it this way, and this is precisely Tony Leggett's problem, then there is no decoherence at all. You just keep on going forever, right? Exponential growth. And I don't have a good answer to that. But this is a question that does not keep me alive at night, awake at night. Do you know why? Because I know of no actual experiment where this is an issue. It may be someday. It may be someday, OK? But right now, it's a purely hypothetical scenario. Any experiment you give me, I can, I can tell you. No, this is not satisfying your answer. I'm just telling you my answer, OK? So hypothetically, I don't know what the distinction is. I completely agree. But I write a lot of papers on experiment. No real experiment, I have had difficulty doing it. So what I'm saying is that, yes, hypothetically, I do not know the answer to your question, what the distinction is. God, give me any real situation, I know exactly what this distinction is. So it may very well be there is something is missing. Maybe Tony Leggett is right. There is a large, some large size beyond which collapse must take place. Or maybe there is a small nonlinear term or something like that. I cannot rule those possibilities out. All I can say is that in real experiments, no one has ever been able to find a situation where this distinction becomes impossible. No, supposing I went bottom up and take Harrison's experiment slowly upwards. Yes. At what level will it collapse? Correct. But that has not. What I'm saying is that this is just a hypothetical scenario. What I'm saying is that Harosh, at Harosh's experiment, to the extent Harosh has done that, that the biggest that has been done is Reiner Blatt with 14, 14. Up to 14, there is no problem. I agree with you that if I just use English language, uh, since, since when the number is 10 to the 23 particles, I expect classical systems, some of them may be a problem. I think the problem will come entirely from decoherence. What happens is that as I increase the number of, uh, uh, of microscopic constituents, and I glossed over all these things, your possibility of decoherence also goes up exponentially. Meaning environment starts affecting it much, 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 much more. So what would happen in reality, I think, I'm giving you my, my um, um, explanation, is that as you increase the number of particles, it is indeed true that if you could take them all the way to the 23, you are going to see a classical cat, meaning you are going to see a large system which is quantum mechanical. In reality, that doesn't happen because as you increase the number of particles in every model I've seen, your decoherence increases super exponentially. So that means as you're making, as you're going from 14 to 200, the system will decohere. So was well, the system decohere? But 
Purely hypothetical question you are asking is very important. And I don't have an answer to that because I do not think there is a unique number. I think it depends on all the details, particularly depends on the kind of environment you have. This is what I believe, okay? I believe this question will never be answered with pristine precision because it will depend on the details. What is the system interacting with? But being a complete quantum mechanic, Mr. Quantum Mechanician, since I believe in quantum mechanics much more than I believe in classical mechanics, my answer would be, if you can keep the system really isolated from the environment, it will never decohere. It will always give you the quantum mechanical property. But all systems I have looked at, the decoherence goes up exponentially, so very soon, quantum mechanics disappears. But it's a good question to which, as you know, nobody has an answer. And I don't either. I'm, I'm not going to pretend I do. I just don't consider it to be much of a problem. But that doesn't mean I have an answer. I want to distinguish the two, OK? So somebody else had a question. Yes, please. Measurement does not violate causality. Oh, that's, yeah, that, 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 of course, even Einstein knew that is not a big issue at all. Because you cannot, you cannot transfer information faster than the speed of light. So relativity doesn't say that you cannot have any velocity higher than the velocity of light. It just basically says no meaningful velocity can be larger than velocity of light. Group velocity cannot be larger. And any case where you do this, you show that group velocity is not larger. Meaning, you do that experiment there. So let's say that you are in that other galaxy, and you see spin is along x direction. And you conclude that means the spin in the laboratory object is in minus x direction, right? But you cannot transfer that information to the laboratory. To transfer that information, you will go at the lower than the velocity of light. You know that, but unless you transfer it, nothing has been transferred, OK? Did I answer your question? Yeah, two persons can measure it. But the thing is that, and people have done, this is actually, for quantum encryption, this is a very big thing. But in all cases, you can show that relativity is not violated. In the specific cases people looked at, that they, the moment they try to communicate with each other, it's, it cannot be done faster than velocity of light. Now, this issue still needs more theoretical work. This issue still needs more theoretical work. I'm not an expert on it, so I may even be saying something wrong. But the cases I have seen, there is no problem. OK? Right. Measures one way, and right. another person measures in another way right. at different, right. different places. Right. Then what happens to the particle? It, like, that, that it's, the, not, it's not violating relativity because they cannot communicate. Uh, so, but, but one entangle, one measurement makes another thing other way. Correct. But if the same time other one is measured other way, what happens? Correct. So, 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 so the thing is, these are of course all the. This is why people think it's mysterious that I measure it to be in the in the. I measure it to be the up direction in z, so I know it's in minus z in there, and the person there measures it along plus x direction and he measures it to be something else. The point I'll make is that these experiments always give consistent results. But when you start thinking about it that way, you say, if I could do this, then there'll be paradox. This paradox has never arisen in any experiment anywhere, is what I'm saying, OK? And, and without an experiment, it's very difficult to talk about it in, in, in abstract uh, construct. You know? So I do not know what to say to you, because by your very question, you are raising a puzzle, OK? And, and, it, and this puzzle is a semantic puzzle. You don't have an experiment. You can't point to an experiment. All I can tell you, no real experiment, this puzzle arises. Okay? So this delayed choice experiment has been done. These experiments have been done. And, uh, and you, you can use them to communicate with each other. But no violation of anything has been found, either relativity or quantum mechanics. I know I'm not giving you a very satisfactory answer. Trust me, if the answers are very satisfactory, all these great minds would not think there is a problem. Okay? And I'm just trying to say there is another viewpoint where there is no problem. Uh, everything works, OK? But that does not mean I'm saying no one should ever think there is a problem. That's a different statement. Yeah. I think this is the last question, because, uh, yeah. OK. Yeah. Oh, but I mean, I mean, I'm a physicist, I'm a theoretical physicist. So all theoretical physicists, every single one of them, all they know is how to work. If you work, you have to work in a thought, and the thought to be quantum mechanical. It's in 925. All of them, every single one of them is quantum mechanical.